much about general payment information modeling than we consider uh, high dimensional uh, modeling, high dimensional object, right, and semi supervised clustering. Uh, so, the plan for today is first to consider what can be done with categorical sequences. And uh, the second lecture is going to be uh, very much application driven. It's, uh, like it's a very recent development, basically, and uh, there are some interesting results. There will be a little less finite picture modeling and a little bit more talking. All right, so, so speaking of uh, categorical sequences. So categorical sequence looks like this. So basically, y1, y2, and we go up to yt. Uh, t is the length of this sequence in this particular case. And this kind of data arises in social sciences very frequently. And uh, this is one of the uh, like major types of data that arise in social sciences. And typically, uh, what people try to do with such data to uh, represent uh, basically life pattern. Consider a sequence of major life events. What, what are the major life events? Uh, marriage, uh, finishing school, getting a divorce, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> like we uh, will we'll talk about the authors actually. Yeah. You know, authors actually will be quite uh, quite unusual sometimes. Yeah. All right. Uh, sometimes uh, such sequences can be also found in medical studies where medical records can be also called it this way. It's basically a sequence of some health-related events. Uh, so, for example, uh, getting vaccinated or getting a surgery or like going to a doctor specifically to treat pool, etc. Right? So it's also a sequence of categorical events. Uh, categorical uh, data, basically. And, uh, uh, also, another very popular actually replication of categorical sequences is uh, in traffic analytics. So this kind of data is known as clickstream analysis, uh, cl uh, such such uh, uh, clickstream data. And basically, if you go to a like news website or you, for example, visit Amazon, you go through a sequence of different web pages of categories of web pages. And this way, you basically generate a clickstream. Uh, click so basically, clickstream is just a sequence of web pages visited, or categories of web pages. It depends on like, how you represent it. Okay, what are the challenges with the analysis of categorical sequences? First of all, the, the first challenge is that the data are categorical, because most of the methods, especially in cluster analysis, they are developed for clustering. Uh, quantitative data, not categorical data. Another important feature of such uh, data is that there is a dynamic nature. There is a very specific order that has to be somehow taken into consideration. And the third challenge uh, is that such data oftentimes uh, are very messy. There are lots of, if you think about something like Amazon, there are hundreds of thousands, of maybe even millions of clicks in sequences accumulated over time. All right, so this is basically the slide that you have seen before. So <coughs> this is about cluster analysis, about a variety of different methods. But the most important message here is uh, in the very last sentence that basically the majority of approaches are designed for quantitative data. <coughs> All right. Uh, Currently, <coughs> to the best of my knowledge, there are three packages that deal with clustering categorical sequences. The first one, and this one is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by far the most popular, Tremine R, that implements hierarchical clustering. Um, this package is created by people uh, who actually, I think, um, first started analyzing uh, categorical sequences. And so uh, this is, they, uh, basically they promote their, uh, their package and it's very, very popular in this specific area, especially in social studies. So. Then there is a, our package clickstream. Uh, 
No, and Tremainar basically implements hierarchical clusters. Uh, Clickstream package implements uh, key means algorithm based on transition frequency matrices. So for each sequence, basically, uh, they calculate the matrix of uh, frequencies, of transition frequencies. And so the uh, last package, this is what I'm going to talk about first. This is basically click cluster. It's not as popular as the other two because it's like, uh, I think, well, I don't know why, okay? Uh, not yet, but, but still, actually, this area is surprisingly, like, when, when I started uh, working in this direction, actually, I didn't expect how popular this direction can be. So, for example, even click class, even though it's less popular than the other two packages, uh, currently, I think it's around 150,000 downloads of, of that package. So it's like quite many people actually use this kind of uh, data. Okay, so here the idea is going to be pretty, si uh, pretty simple, especially in the beginning of what we're going to talk about. Uh, so we will assume the first order market model to model uh, sequences. So basically each sequence is going to be uh, folded in this way. Ti is going to be the length of the sequence and uh, we, will, we will assume first order Markov model, so based on the uh, Markov model top, basically we will rewrite the probability of observing a specific sequence in this way. Of course, if we, oops, uh, um, but we can consider if we want higher order market models, but uh, actually one typical issue for this kind of data is that uh, we don't want to all parameterize the model. We don't want to have too many states. So <clears throat> to simplify notation a little bit, I will use beta to represent the initial state probability. So this is the probability of observing a specific state initially. And so all transition probabilities are going to be denoted as gamma. So basically, this is the uh, probability that we uh, transition it, uh, from the state y i at point t minus 1. This is our current location to the state uh, y i t. Uh, of course, there should be constraints. Sum of the initial state probability should be equal to 1. And the sum of uh, probabilities in the transition probability matrix, like initial, they should sum up to 1. Um, also, xi will be denoting the transition frequency matrix. So basically, this is the counts, uh, counts for the associated with each transition um, in the process. Okay. So then we can use, we can right away write down the mixture model that can be formulated this way. So it's a, like a pretty simple idea, and let's see it, what happens with it. So basically, the M algorithm is very simple. Uh, everything is analytically available, like all expressions. And if we want to somehow visualize the results of the data, this is what we can do. So on the left hand side, you can see that, oh, okay, first of all, what, what, what does this mean? Okay, so this is just an example. This is the transition probability matrix 5 by 5. This is an example uh, for two cluster solution. So this is the first cluster. You can see this first block. And the second block represents the second cluster. Uh, each horizontal line within the cluster represents an observation. And the color uh, represents the associated relative frequency or proportion of uh, transitions, basically, from a particular state to state 1, 2, 3, or 5. So this is pretty much just a folded uh, uh, clustering solution. These <laughs> rectangles represent initial uh, state probabilities. It's like, uh, it depends on the data. Sometimes it's, you, you can see the distinction between clusters and sometimes it's difficult to see. If it's not very easy to see, you can also take a look at the basically prob uh, transition probability matrices themselves. Just hold them according to the colors and how you can read it. Basically, you can take a look at if you are in the state one, 
you can see that this is like the darkest pink, right? The highest probability is to jump to state five. From state five, for example, you most likely jump to state one or two, etc. So why is it <coughs> convenient? Because you can see basically what are the differences <coughs> between clusters. <coughs> so what 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 kind of uh, what sort of transitions drives the distinction between cluster one and cluster two? This is just an example, please. All right. And of course, there is a legend, right? Yes. So the diagonal of this is that is that a self image? Is that showing that you stay in the same state? Yeah. 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 So like um, oftentimes, and actually in, in the example I'm going to consider, um, it can represent a category. Like later, I will consider a data set that corresponds to the uh, news website. And you can stay within, let's say, category scores and read pages again and again and again if you are interested in scores. So you can transition within this, you would say, category, you can stay there. Actually, it's this, uh, this kind of transitions is for fleet scale data is uh, one of the most popular. All right. So uh, now there is a slight modification of this idea. Uh, so there is such a thing as by clustering. In cluster analysis, in the traditional cluster analysis, we uh, group observations, right, in such a way that observations in, in the groups are uh, similar and groups are as distinct as possible. But sometimes there is uh, a need to also group features, not only to group variables, right, not, not just observations, but also variables. Uh, like I put by clustering in italic because it's not exactly by clustering but somewhat similar uh, idea. So basically, the idea is what if uh, we have many states and some states actually behave in a very similar way. If you think about something like uh, web pages of Amazon, right? You can be interested in, let's say, camcorders, and there are different models. Maybe people actually like very, very. Similar camcorders, right? And maybe people uh, exhibit pretty much the same behavior visiting different pages, right? So, in this case, it would be great to actually combine such states into some groups, right? So, um, this allows us, first of all, to reduce the number of uh, unnecessary states. So, such uh, states will be called equivalent states. And uh, such that uh, they behave similarly, and so uh, we will also have equivalent blocks. These are the blocks that uh, include equivalent states. What are the conditions? So, basically, uh, within these equivalent blocks, transitions to equivalent states and from equivalent states, they have to be the same. So, basically, in terms of transition probabilities, we do not have any uh, distinction. So, then we can basically. Uh, consider them together. And uh, we can come up with different algorithms, but we can come up with something that we already we've seen already, something like backward forward selection, right? We can either start with all states combined <coughs> into one equivalent block first and then try to split this block, or we can go in the opposite direction. We can start with every state representing a separate block. Uh, like in individual block and then try to merge them. And um, also there is actually, uh, we added the step number three here. This is the state rearrangement between the blocks. Actually, it, sometimes it shows very good performance and sometimes it can help quite a bit to find a good model. So basically we keep the same number of equivalent blocks, but we can try to switch the blocks between the uh, states between the equivalent blocks. And so uh, the M algorithm is pretty much the same. This three step is the same. This is how the M step is modified. So these are like now uh, <coughs> parameters written in terms of blocks. Formulas written in terms of blocks. Okay, now let's take a look at what kind of application we can have here. So this is again publicly available data set, msnbc.com. To be honest, I don't remember where I found it, but I, I have a resource somewhere like All right, so it's a large data set. 
but there is a huge. Uh, this is this is basically a news website, right? And so <coughs> the data set is very large, but unfortunately, there are too many short sequences. Like this is the reality, basically. Sometimes people visit the website, take a look at a couple of web pages, and then leave, right? So. Uh, to test uh, basically this, this idea, I wanted to have uh, sequences that are a little bit more representative uh, and a little bit longer, right? Because basically you don't have too many transitions if you have any good sequences in uh, length two or three. So basically, <coughs> in the original data, we have 17 categories front page, front page news, tech, local news, opinion, etc. Right, miscellaneous, weather, uh, etc. And uh, I focused here on the data set that includes 323 observations, and the length of uh, sequences is actually from 24 to 361. Um, I tried to recall today why it's from 34 to 361. I think 34 is chosen as just two times the number of states, most likely. Okay, so basically, at least we have some decent length of sequences to see if this approach will work or not. All right, so this is basically what is going on. Uh, we have found three clusters. And if you take a look at the very first cluster, right, this is basically the upper, upper block. So we have one, two, three, right? In each cell we have three blocks. So the first block represents the first cluster, second block represents the second cluster, and the third cluster. You can actually see that the majority, like here, 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 and here, right? And actually probably, I'm not sure, from here. Yeah, even here, right? This is basically, this first cluster is exactly driven by transitions within the same category. So basically a person interested in sports, right? Category just enters this category and stays there. And basically there are not too many transitions to other groups. If we take a look at the second um, block, the second group, uh, okay, the majority of transitions are associated with the news uh, category. If you take a look here, front page to news, right? From news you stay in news, from business you go to news, from sports you go to news, from summary you go to news, from news you may go to summary, right? So basically this is somewhat news-driven um, cluster. And the third one, um, for the third one actually, like, okay, let's see. From the front page, we either stay in front page or we go to news. From news, we either stay in news or jump to business or summary. Oops, these are the highest probabilities. So, okay, what happens after we go to business? Um, we actually jump to sports, right? Sports news. <laughs> From sports, we have high chance to go to miscellaneous news. And from here, we go to local news. Actually, it was sort of interesting because in some sense, this represents, I think, pretty much the order in which, uh, like in the news program on TV, for example, they present the news, right? Some, some bigger news, then business news, then sports, then something, what happens locally, miscellaneous news, right? And something like this. So, <clears throat> At least uh, this is basically the original idea we're going to build on. Okay, so this is like what we can start with. Uh, Makes sense, right? Okay. Oh, sorry, quick question. Yes. Did you? Uh, actually, yeah, this, yeah. I, was, I was just wondering if you guys wanted anything on these clusters. Like being in one of these clusters and just for one of these clusters. Like, so, so basically, we have more many, many sequences, right? And we want to find some uh, common patterns in like how visitors of this, of this website, how they behave. And we want to find like some common patterns. So basically what I'm 
trying to show it this Bayesian DIC and Bayesian this model, we have identified three common patterns, right? So each cluster represents basically, of, of, like, this is of course just a visualization tool where I try to highlight those frequencies that are more, uh, like, more likely than other frequencies, right? But, uh, like, for example, as with the first one, you see, we have higher probabilities, right, uh, associated with staying in the same category. So basically, these are this front page, okay, once again, this is like transition from front page, front page to front page. This is front page to use. Right? So looking at these squares or rectangles, right, we can uh, try to guess what drives the uh, navigation patterns for this uh, website visitors. Mm -hmm. You said the minimum sequence length was 31 questions or something? Like 30. Not, uh, so the minimal number was 34. Uh, the, the length, sequence length, sequence length, the mi minimal is 34, I think. Yeah. Yes. And Doesn't that seem very high to stay on one website? Uh, it's, it's, it may be yes and maybe no. I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm wondering also about this. Like, like <laughs> I would say if I read news, like me personally, <laughs> I probably read like maybe from 10 to 20 different pages mm -hmm. at, at, at once. Yeah. But again, I, I picked like it was a really big data, a data set, right? And I wanted sort of to test it to see if it even works. If I pick uh, like, like yes, it would be interesting to take a look at what like overall to analyze the entire data set. But here I mostly I, I wanted basically to have more transitions than in the data. So it's uh, I'm not sure. 323 from the original data set, maybe it's like three percent or two percent of the original data set. So I intentionally picked those sequences that are longer than the usual. Yes. But uh, still, I, I, there are plenty actually of sequences also with length like 10 or 5. Uh -huh. So the person probably spent like 5 10 minutes reading this and just do it. Yeah. Yes? Do you know for sure that these are all human if it's already boss? No, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like that's the, sequence, the best answer I can give, like I, I don't know. Does the data set have anything in it that you use maybe to filter that out? Like, do you have any information about how long someone stays on a website? No, the data set doesn't show it. Yes. Uh, actually, there is another paper uh, by people from Canada who actually. Uh, I don't think they can actually. Uh, okay, so they wrote the paper basically based on this data set. And they said, okay, we will simulate the data uh, for how, how much time you spend in each state. And as far as I know, they were not able to publish it because th this is not a real data set, right? Because they sort of simulate. I'm not sure if they were able to publish it eventually or not, but yes, there was such an idea. But it's sort of difficult to find such a data, such a data set unless you have access to it, right? But th this data set is publicly available, but unfortunately there are no types. Okay, this is basically what, this is the summary of what I already showed. So cluster one is characterized by transitions within the same uh, categories. Cluster two is characterized by transitions around the state news, and cluster three is, well, I would say, one of the typical uh, transition patterns is front page news, then business, then sports, miscellaneous, and local. All right. Now let's see what, how we can generalize it to the situation when we have multivariate categorical sequences. So this, um, this is actually a situation when you observe not just one sequence, but you observe several multivariate sequences simultaneously. So basically each, uh, uh, okay, let's take a look at the sample, sample application. Maybe you observe here, right, using one sequence in the second sequence, you observe uh, professional well-being and maybe private life, etc. So you you consider several sequences simultaneously, and each sequence is a uh, univariate sequence, like we considered before. But now we, we will have a P of them. Okay? We will assume that each sequence can have a different number of states. So the number of states in the sequence is denoted as, as J. Um, of course, uh, it is the, the first idea that we can consider, right? 
what if we take all these multivariate well, this multivariate sequence and basically represent it as just one multivariate sequence right, with many states? But the number of states would be like a product of SJs. Even if I take like p equals three, right, just three sequences, and each sequence will have five states, it will result in because we have initial state probabilities, transition probabilities. So we will have like over fifteen and a half thousand parameters associated with this model. So <clears throat> I will show you later in the example. Uh, basically, we will have issues with uh, with, uh, with univariate sequence with representing it's a too complicated model. So we have to come up with something else. Uh, and by the way, this is basically my notation. So this is the multivariate sequence. This is uh, Joint state y1. This is the second point of right, second point and the p point. So basically, we have, as you can see, p uh, uh, univariate sequences here. All right. So this is how we plan to attack this model. So the beginning is exactly the same. We will assume uh, the first order of Markov model. So probability of uh, observing my multivariate sequence can be uh, written this way. But uh, now I need to decide what to do with this probability, right? With this unit uh, and with this probability. So uh, I will make two assumptions here. And we think they are quite reasonable here. So first I will assume the independence of initial states. And I, I don't think it's a very big deal. Uh, that we will assume that initial, state, uh, initial states are independent of each other. Then I will also assume the conditional independence of transition given the current joint location. So basically, I will assume conditional independence here. So if I know the joint location, current location, uh, basically, I will assume that uh, transitions are going to be uh, <coughs> independent. So then I can basically rewrite this probability this way. But still, there is an issue regarding how to model this probability, right? This is the uh, given my joint current location, this is the probability that the uh, next transition is going to be to YTG. Okay? And here we propose the following idea. We, we think that it is reasonable actually to model this uh, conditional probability using a mixture. So here the idea is the following. We assume that every sequence, every invariant sequence actually contributes to the transition in, within the JF sequence. Look, here we jump, with, we have a transition in the JF sequence, right? This uh, state changes. But we assume that every univariate sequence contributes to this transition. So, uh, would it make even sense? If you think about something like, uh, as I uh, give you an example, one, for example, one univariate sequence is uh, about the financial term, right? Another univariate sequence is about the uh, health of the person, right? Well, if a person has, for example, some medical problems, right, it is likely to lead to some financial issues, right? So actually it makes sense that some sequences can interact, right? So it's possible that they can be interacted. <coughs> so uh, this is my basically mixing proportion also, delta because it's a mixture, right? So it's a uh, basically weight of the J, J prime sequence on the, on the transition in the sequence J, okay? So this is how I plan to model this uh, conditional probability. Does this make sense? So basically, all sub, uh, all invariant sequences are going to contribute to the transition within the J sequence. All right. <clears throat> what happened then here? Well, uh, transition probability matrices are not going to be square matrices anymore. They are going to be S J prime by S J, right? Because we can have different number of uh, states in our univariate sequences, right? This is why we're going to have this situation. Still, we have to require that some of probabilities within the rows uh, have to be equal to one, right? 
But this is basically how we can uh, write the probability of our of observing our sequence. And now we will extend it to the Yuxian model, right? So that we can model heterogeneity in multi categorical sequences. So <coughs> this is basically just exactly the same formula as before. I just put a Yuxian on top of it. <coughs> All right, this is the complete data likelihood. As you can see, we have two pieces of unknown information. ZI is before is the label of the group, right? Because we have key groups, and ZI will be the group label. And WTJ, this is going to be the posterior probability associated with the subsequence that contributed to the transition in the J sequence of time T. Right? So it's basically a label of the subsequence. You remember, we model we model <coughs> the transition uh, in, within the J sequence at time t as a mixture model of all the Nivellian right, uh, uh, sequences. So WTJ is, represents the sub, uh, this univariate sequence label of that sequence that contributes. Basically, it's like we pretend that this is our missing information. <coughs> all right. So this is basically how the Q function looks like it looks like a little bit longer than the usual because I put these uh, constraints in there because there, are, uh, there is a number of constraints that we need to take into consideration. But again, the nice thing about this is that we actually can get everything in closed form. So, first of all, E step tau i k, the mean is before. This is the posterior probability that the i categorical sequence belongs to the Kiev component, and these are probabilities, posterior probabilities associated or weights associated with univariate sequences, right? That contribute to the transition with, in the JF uh, sequence. Make sense? All right. M step, basically. We can estimate all these parameters. Everything is nice. All right, let's take a look now at uh, how it works. So we consider two simulation studies. The first one I would say is a little bit simplistic. The second is a little bit more sophisticated. In the first study, we assume uh, that we have three univariate sequences considered at the same time. The first sequence has just two states, second has three states, and the third has four states. Uh, and basically, in the second simulation study, I multiply the number of states by three. And the number of components in both cases is three. So I hope to find these clusters. Um, so we will try to take a look at different lengths of sequences, different sample sizes, and we will also take a look at uh, 100 replications. All right. So these are the results. Uh, here M stands for the multivariate, U stands for the univariate. U basically represents the case when we uh, model this multivariate sequence as a univariate uh, as a univariate sequence with a large number of states, right? So basically with the product of SJ states. So this is just reparameterization. The disadvantage of this model, U univariate one, is as I said before, is going to be that we are going to have a huge number of states, right? Potentially, if, if we have more states in our uh, sequences, right? This is going to be less and less applicable. Okay, but in this case, what happens? So, first of all, when sequences are short, like 10, right? Uh, and we have just 100 data points, we can, both methods actually are not particularly good. We can find pretty much uh, the correct uh, setting, right? Because uh, what we want to find, we want to find k equals t, right? So, this is the sample. All right, so when we increase the sequence, we can see some improve, uh, sequence length, right? We can see some improvement. Now, in 34 cases, we identified two clusters. When we go to 50, we already found 98. When we go to uh, 100, okay, we found 100. Look, still, uh, unilinear approach still has just 100, uh, like, with k for one. So basically, as you can see, as a result, it just the this is also going to be zero, which uh, for us it's already one. 
Okay, but this is basically this is a very long sequence, but we have very few sequences. No, not very few, but not, not too many, right? Okay, let's increase the number of sequences and take a look again. Now uh, it's pretty much the same. For us, it just happens that we are getting to three clusters faster, right? As you can see, even here for P equals 25, so basically we don't need that uh, long sequences anymore. And uh, we can see that univariate approach is still struggles. Like, you know, 100 cases actually we are in trouble. Okay, let's increase it even more. So you can see that our approach again uh, performs good. And finally, we observe that univariate, uh, uh, univariate categorical sequence approach also starts, uh, starts moving out from detecting just one cluster and finds three clusters in 95 cases. So basically, what's the conclusion here? The conclusion, I guess, is that uh, we have to have lots of data in, in order to find this, uh, in order to use this idea with representing a multivariate categorical sequence as a univariate sequence with a huge number of states, with a large number of states. But this case was simple, right? We had two, three, and four states in, the, in in each sequence. All right, what happens if I multiply it by three? So uh, we have now six, nine, and 12 states. Well, in this case, actually, if we calculate, we will, in this particular mixture model, we have over one million parameters if we want to uh, represent it as a univariate sequence, and this simply doesn't work for us. Okay, try it, doesn't work. It's too, many, too many parameters. So I do not even represent you here, but with this approach, you can still see that basically we can actually get reasonable result as long as we have sufficiently long sequences, right, and uh, sufficiently many observations. So uh, this is encouraging. <coughs> All right, does this make sense? So this is like I, I think an interesting extension to the situation where we and how we can actually model multivariate categorical sequences. All right, now. Uh, let's talk about the following. Can we? Can we? Yeah. Okay. So I will a uh, little bit speed up. Probably. Thank you. So up to this point, we consider the situation when transition probabilities were assumed constant, right? We assume that no matter what happens, the transition probability is a constant. But in, there are many situations, especially in the examples I provided with life. Uh, with, uh, with sequences representing major life events, right? There are situations when actually these transitions cannot be assumed constant. Like for example, child born. Probably probabilities cannot be assumed to be the same for transitioning to the state child born for different ages of people, right? So probably, uh, I don't know, but it seems like the probability of giving a birth at the age of 70 is much less likely than giving a birth at the age of, let's say, 25 or 30, right? And things like this. Uh, also, for medical records, cancer or kidney disease, they are much more likely to uh, develop in people who are older, right, rather than younger. So it seems like it might be of interest to incorporate, actually, uh, some time into these transitions. So this is like pretty much exactly the same notation with slight modifications. So this is my sequence, but now for uh, at each moment, I, I also have time associated with this. In my particular example that I will consider is going to represent the age of a person, okay? All right, so this is how my entire data set is formulated. So T represents the time vector and uh, as you can see, I still have beta and gamma, beta initial state probabilities, gamma probabilities of transitions, but now I want them to be functions of time. So I want them to be functions of time, and such that at any time point, they still have, of course, properties of the initial state vector and the transition probability matrix. So it has to be transition probability matrix, no matter what time t we choose. <coughs> All right. This is basically how we can formulate it. It's exactly the same way as before, it's just now time dependent, so time is incorporated in here. Um, so I will probably jump to the next one. And uh, 
this is also E step. E step is no different. Uh, for the M step, as I said, we need to make sure that we have we have some flexible functions for beta to model beta and to model gamma. And actually, there was an interesting discussion in the book on multivariate analysis of, uh, by Krzanowski, published in 1994. Uh, the author discusses several options. And basically, this is what uh, is recommended in the book, and this is exactly what we employ and see how it works. So basically, this, this set of functions guarantees that, of course, uh, we will have at each uh, fixed time point t, we will have uh, uh, valid trans uh, initial state probabilities and same for transition probabilities. So basically, we choose them to be like this. OK, now we took a look at uh, how flexible these functions are, just, just to see whether we can actually use them to model. It seems like they are reasonable. Sometimes, you see, we can have higher probabilities in the beginning. Sometimes we can have higher probabilities in the end. Sometimes we can have a hump in the middle. So it seems like, <coughs> excuse me, this function is flexible enough at least to give it a try. OK, so here first we try simulation study. Um, and we consider several competitors. So the first uh, method, this is what we basically propose. And we can choose k, uh, k hat based on GIC, right? Because it's uh, based on finite mission. <laughs> then click plus. This is basically the method that we considered in the very beginning. This, uh, this is pretty much uh, exactly the same, but we assume that transition probabilities do not depend on time. They're constant for any t. The third one is zero order marker model. So basically, uh, here we assume that the uh, prob uh, probability distribution is the same in every row of the transition probability. So basically, it doesn't matter in which state we are currently located. And we also try flip stream. This is, once again, this is uh, key means based on uh, frequencies of transitions. And frame R, this is hierarchical of clustering. Because they are not model based clustering methods, I will assume that I know the true number of clusters, so I'm basically favoring these methods, right? And this is what we're going to take a look at. So we can actually see that, again, this is well expected because I simulated from this model. I hope that this is going to be the case, right? So, but uh, yes, in all cases, basically we perform better. The only case I think where we do not perform better is here, but this is because uh, uh, because uh, these methods, they overestimate the number of components, you see, like the trend. So click stream for zero order, they pick 9762, but if we increase the uh, sequence length, they continue going up, so they are overly basically liberal because they do not have flexibility to model each individual component delicately. So they require more components to, uh, to model well. All right, and here also, uh, click stream and Kerminar, they perform worse, so it seems at least encouraging. So this is the data set we're taking a look at. Uh, uh, it, this is the application to British Healthcare Panel Survey. It's a publicly available data, but unfortunately, it's not so simple to share it. If you are interested, you can actually send the request to UK data services, and they will provide it. So they have some procedure. So data consists or they consist of household uh, data that are collected from 1991 to 2009. And uh, there are 250 areas in, in Great Britain considered, uh, and they are chosen based on the post -holds. In our study, uh, we focus only on females, and we consider only one per household, just to, so that we can assume ID. We don't want to have multiple females from the same household, so basically we have a data set with one female person per household. <coughs> and uh, the data set is huge. We focused on 12 major life events that are typical for social sciences. And this way we obtained uh, 2,803 observations. 
Okay, now let's take a look at what uh, states we have. Twelve states are the following. The first one, school lab. Second, further education lab. This is like institution, or maybe community college, something next after the school. Uh, this is how it was folded in the original data set. Marriage, child born, divorce, job accepted, job left, financial state person, financial state improved, health state person, health state improved, and accident happened. Does school left mean graduated or dropped out? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I am not sure. School left means school left. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, they, you see, in that, in that survey, we were also like interested, but it was like left school, so not in school anymore. And, well, it can be, I think, both, strictly speaking. All right, so if we apply uh, the three methods, zero order Markov model, our proposed method, and three class, we can actually see that it seems that our idea is actually contributes quite a lot. The difference in BIC is dramatic, actually, right? So we fit the data much better than the other model. So probably there is something going on with the change in transition probability over time. Well, it's expected, so, right? Uh, okay, this is the correspondence between the obtained cluster solution by the method for two clusters and <coughs> the other. And I just wanted to show you that pretty much there is no pattern at all, right? There is no, it's not that the other method can closely get the same clusters. So we, we're getting completely different clustering solutions if we use the other methods. All right, now we have like a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, so now we can take a look at what actually happens here. And I have just three pictures to show you and we will be done. Okay, so how we can interpret this? So this is basically initial state probabilities. Uh, this is the age of females, 25, 50, 75, right? This is the probability. Overall, it goes up to one. So uh, <coughs> yellow here, school left. It means that females, I'm not sure what this age, but we can sort of figure out. I think it's around whatever, 16, 17, yeah. So, so, okay, these sort of lines, vertical lines, from here to here, <coughs> they show the actual range of the data. Because we don't want to extrapolate too much, we don't want to guess what will happen if school left is at 75, okay? So this sort of shows you the more or less reliable set of, you know, range of data, what, what we observe. At least, uh, like, so, so that if we consider something here, we are not careful with what because we're extrapolating all the range of our data, right? <clears throat> so you can see that the initial state for younger female, females almost always school left in the first class, right? Here, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when they get closer to 23, maybe 25, uh, marriage is another state that is very often the initial state. If you take a look at the second cluster, you can actually see this little green piece, right? This is actually child born. Uh, so there is not a very large proportion in the second cluster, but like, well, not, not like considerable actually, I don't know, maybe 7, 8 percent, percent or maybe a little more of uh, females that give birth to a baby. This is the, uh, the initial uh, state, the very first state. Now, if we take a look at what happens with transitions, this is the most interesting thing. Uh, so this is basically our transition probability methods. This is state one. And colors represent where we jump from the state one, right? This is state two, and this, is, this represents where we can jump from the state two, etc. So, for example, if you take a look at state one, school left, where young females go after that, this one is Next, education, right? Very likely they go. Otherwise, sometimes they get married, right? Like this is very, very likely. And uh, sometimes they accept a job, but not, not very large proportion. Okay, let's take a look at what happens maybe with the second cluster in order to make a comparison. All right. So here we can see that the child born, right, is a considerable uh, probability here. 
So basically, in the second cluster, many females give birth to a child immediately after, like they finish this. So basically, next event is giving birth to a child. Uh, here, orange. Here is job left, right? Uh, let's see what happens before. Here we don't have job left at all, right? So it seems like <coughs> the second, <coughs> excuse me, second cluster is. Uh, you can probably hopefully see the pattern that uh, second cluster is uh, <coughs> consists of people who a little bit struggle with, with basically with their life. Uh, like if you take a look at, for example, something more. <coughs> let's take a look at maybe divorce, right? That's uh, interesting. So this is cluster. <coughs> this is first cluster. So after wait five is divorce, right? Stage five. What happens in two females in the first cluster? Well, they remarry, right? Majority of them. Or they give birth to a child, but this is like not very, uh, not very large probability. Or they take uh, accept a job, right? So basically, most likely they will remain. Let's take a look at what happens in the second one. Okay. Here you can see like much much higher probability of giving a child after giving a, getting a divorce. So basically, we can analyze these sort of patterns, and we can continue. Actually, it's like um, if you take a look at something like uh, which do let's take a look at health person. Okay, it's HW. This is state ten. Uh, this is cluster one. So if health nursing, uh, this one, yellow, health improved, this is cluster one. People with sort of conventional uh, order of events. And, and this is either job accepted or uh, health improved. This is what happens primarily uh, for females in the first cluster. In the second cluster, <coughs> Okay, this yellow or this blue, right, is considerable. Financial state person, or this red is financial improved, but not very, not very much, right? Or like orange job left. So basically, you can see that this trend continues. Actually, you can, if you take a look at all, all states, it's pretty much in every state. So it's, I think it's interesting sort of to take a look and you can very easily analyze and compare uh, clusters based on this sort of plot. So I think it's uh, basically the main message here is that it's also very important to uh, think about how you visualize the data because sometimes uh, like th there is uh, no advanced idea, right? But sort of at the same time, you can very easily analyze your result and make some interesting inference. Okay. And by the way, final comment about this. Uh, around two thirds of uh, females fall in the first cluster, and around one third fall in the second cluster. If you're interested, in cluster. all right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the United Kingdom.